This is the straight society, the orderly, well-managed, well-disciplined world of the establishment. It is made possible by the Protestant ethic. Work is noble, worldly achievement the sign of God's favor. But not everyone embraces these hallmarks of success. In each city across the land, there exists another culture whose very philosophy and way of life rejects the fierce competition and its material rewards, and in so doing, refutes the order and discipline of the establishment. The hippies, perhaps more than any other social phenomenon, brought the drug issue to the surface, for most of them are children of middle class and upper class families. Thousands of snapshots on police station walls remain the only link between many of America's most affluent families and the children who embodied their great expectations. Nearly everyone in the hippie community smokes marijuana, whether they call it pot, grass, hemp, gauge, joint, or Mary Jane. The marijuana is the basic background for the shared drug experience. The experience is shared to such an extent that roach pipes are always in demand. A roach is a marijuana butt, and it requires some form of holder for those last few drags. The new generation, whether they are runaways or rebels and residents, use marijuana as a symbol of discontent with the basic values of the establishment. For some, there exists a social imperative beyond flaunting society's rules. For these adventurers, the mind-expanding drugs open a window on a whole new frontier. We're lost in a beautiful energy, an energy of life, an energy of love. It's the energy that's in every living entity. It's that energy that we can't know about before we're born, and the energy that's going to happen to us when we die. But we know about the energy before us, man and woman and child and animal not kill animals, not kill a fly. And if we love all that energy, we'll love life so much that we'll never die because you'll be so sure that you're part of God and part of that life energy, that universal poetry of love. With LSD, the user believes he is discovering inner truth, that he is making a pilgrimage to the soul, that he has achieved unity with the universe. Under the psychedelic influence of hallucinatory drugs, the user often feels that he is experiencing the supreme private joy of spontaneous creation, both in music and in the visual arts. Both are brought together by the discotheque in a unique blend of Art Nouveau and acid rock. of LSD, particularly on the college campus and even in hippie circles, is on the downswing. Recent publicity linking the drug with severe psychotic reactions, chromosome breaks, and serious birth defects has had a sobering effect. In the runaway colonies, those who forsake LSD seem to move in one of two directions, meditation or method reading. First, the meditators, often ministered to by a guru or a swami, they band together in communes, attempting to live a Thoreau-like existence. They are relatively harmless, true flower children, soldiers of peace and a gentle revolution. The 
second group finds its kicks liquefying on a hot spoon. Methadrine, perhaps the fastest jolt found so far in the amphetamines, can be counted on to provide a six-hour surge of euphoria. but it is accompanied by psychological dependence from which withdrawal can be a serious problem. I tried methadrine with my wife, which I became very addicted to. And then from there, the suicide, actual suicide attempts have been in the last six or seven months, the real ones. All the attention I got, I was sent to a psychiatrist who taught me how to play chess at age nine. I wouldn't talk to him. So then I, my parents got quite upset because of the money they were spending. So then I tried again. They took me away from the psychiatrist for a while and changed schools on me. And then from there, uh, several more attempts like swallowing aspirin, cutting my wrist, which doesn't work because blood coagulates and so forth. I called my parents and I was addicted to it. Amphetamine bisulfate crystal, which is that you shoot as crystal, you know what that is. And I called them and I said I was addicted, I wanted to come home, I'd do anything, i you know, con conform to your standards, or your rules, so forth, go to LSU and O, you know, be the perfect model of everything. And they said, no, you'd upset the family and sent me off to Oregon. And I withdrew five days cold turkey on a Greyhound bus going to Oregon. Methadrine, LSD, heroin, are the exception with the drug community. Marijuana is the common denominator. It's used universally within the hippie cults, in the ghettos, and in the high schools of every social and economic level. As a rough estimate, I would say that at least 10% of the students have, uh, have used and are using uh, marijuana. Now the frequency may vary and I, it's pretty difficult to estimate, but also a very, probably a very significant thing is that acceptance is, is uh, gaining steadily and the usage is really uh, increasing very, very rapidly. But with marijuana comes eventual confrontation with the law. Even though many authorities consider it less harmful than alcohol, it's mere possession in the eyes of the federal statutes, brings a minimum of two years and selling a maximum of 40. We got a few seconds. I want to say something about what happened to Barry McGuire. Barry McGuire wasn't rolling any grass and he wasn't doing anything. He got busted anyway. And he's on his way down to Malibu jail now. And his wife is trying to get him out. And they're not holding any bread. They've been known to plant things on you, like uh, if you're in a place like, say, the Seven Seas, they'll plant something in your pocket if they want you. And they don't even have to find something. They could find an empty matchbox, and by the time it gets to the lab, it's full of grass. Norm and his friends. This time, New Orleans is the pad. But the complaint against the establishment remains the same. Why should the adults put us down? They have their own kind of drugs, coffee, cigarettes, and a host of synthetic crutches that range from sleeping pills and tranquilizers to benzodrine, but mainly booze. Nationally, really, the marijuana laws nationally are, it's just a thing by the uh, alcohol companies to keep their thing going because, uh, I mean, who'd drink if they had grass, man? <laughs> I feel that marijuana is a beautiful drug because it's much safer than alcohol. LSD, heroin, smack, speed are no good because they, they will wreck a person's physical composition. That we do not allow. We started this club as a thing because a lot of
lot of our, our uh, members are tired of a lot of society's rules. We like to be ourselves. We like to go out, get high, ride bikes, and do what we want to do. Because we wear these cutaways, it, it's, a, it's a symbol of unconformity. San Francisco, New Orleans, and New York. Each city has its own legion of disenchanted youth, each casting its dissenting vote against the establishment. The ballots may be written on marijuana, methadrine, or motorcycles. But in each case, they are putting us down, and the vote is an international one. Britain, traditionally the very seat of the establishment, it's ironic that after nine centuries of greatness, this conservative kingdom and her maturity should give birth to the hippie. Uh, it's very hard to live like a bitnik. Sometimes uh, you've got to sleep on the fields or on the street because you've got no place to go, no place to sleep, no money. Uh, I first uh, started taking drugs in uh, Great Britain. Uh, the f uh, drugs became popular among the youth, uh, the world's youth. And just uh, because uh, I first started uh, the different pop groups like the Beatles, the Stones, the Yardbirds, the Kings. A phenomenon throughout Europe, the Middle East, and many parts of Asia is the constant migration of young people an international beatnik set, permanently drifting. In Rome, the gathering spot is the Spanish steppes. For the enterprising migrant with surplus drugs in his rucksack, there are ample business opportunities. I know how to earn uh, money out of it. If I bring a hash from Istanbul, or from Beirut, or from Morocco, or from North Africa, which is very cheap to get it there, you can get a whole kilo, sometimes with five, six, or not more than ten dollars and you can sell it. Here in Italy, it's very expensive. Like the Spanish steps, Yenner's in Istanbul is another beatnik capistrano. It is a clearinghouse for international drug news, a congregating point for the who's who among teenage wayfarers, and even serves as an effective post office. Nearly all of the world's ancient and exotic cities have certain hotels and restaurants not listed in the travel guides but nevertheless engaged in a thriving business. It's uh, a very interesting little scene here in Istanbul, and it's becoming, it's becoming very, very sort of well-known. Not sweepingly well-known, but known in a, in a great number of places all over the world, in Europe and in America. There is a, a hotel where a lot of people live around here, this hotel that I, I, was, I mentioned before. And the name of the hotel is, is on the lips of people that are getting off boats in Europe, from America. People have come to this, to, to this town, to Istanbul, and asked where such and such a hotel is. They've heard it from people in America. And it's, it's interesting to me that, that such a small little place in a little back, back street has, has become so, so, so well known. These gathering places are virtually the United Nations in miniature. Young travelers come from Australia, London, Stockholm, and recently in ever-increasing numbers from Pennsylvania, Indiana, Oregon, they pass in an endless progression through the cities of the Holy Land. They huddle for comfort in caves on the island of Crete. Why do they wander? For some, undoubtedly, it is the adventure of youth, a healthy restlessness, a chance to participate in this once-in-a-lifetime odyssey and sample the fires of spring. For many others, it is a pilgrimage to the mystic repositories of wisdom and truth. These intellectual and spiritual objectives, or what often passes for them, become readily apparent when you're in the Himalayas at 4,500 feet, particularly when the company is good and the roach pipes are lit. Now time and space become distorted, 
and the well springs of energy rush forth. This is probably the fourth people coming for pilgrimages for centuries from all parts of the world. I believe they deposited a great deal of their energy here. Those people which remain here, they find this energy simply by meeting so many beautiful people. If their aimless searching is a thinly guised excuse to evade responsibility, then in effect they have not escaped at all. For even at the threshold of Shangri-La, they become the focal point of world concern. And ironically, concern from that part of the world they have the least use for, the straight society. Many of them claim they have found some kind of new feelings, new uh, insights, uh, a new religious experience. But I would like to point out that these, and I have known between 1,200 and 1,500 addicts in the last 10 years of my life, that I have not found one of them who can claim that they have taken a new position on, on values, have been able to, if you will, move out into the world and, and uh, find a more comfortable existence, have changed things, have, have made uh, life more meaningful for somebody else. I find more and more a selfish existence, more and more self-centered and less and less concerned about the problems of the world and more and more concerned about the escape from the problems of the world. But even the straight society often makes hasty judgments, which instead of strengthening communication between parents and their young, actually drives a wedge in deeper. It's important that we not equate something like long hair, which many of us don't like, because we can't tell the boys from the girls. But to equate long hair with the danger of taking a drug like LSD is really a tragedy. And the youngster, when we equate the two, is liable to turn out and stop listening to us and then go on and really take these other drugs. Cases of drug abuse and addiction and random use of drugs have given rise to progressively increasing numbers of admissions to psychiatric hospitals like this one here, Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital. There have been large numbers of mixed types of drugs taken by populations including for the first time in the last few years young people, middle class young people uh, that have given rise to admissions to a psychiatric hospital with acute psychiatric manifestations. Hey, see, there's speed freaks and there's meth heads. Now, that's the difference. Most of the people I know are not speed freaks. They're meth heads. Now, you can make an A-head. I'm giving a guy over, giving a guy too much. I almost come close to being an A-head. Hey, when I was young, years ago, we had a set down here at Tetris. I think I'm about the only one that's got any sanity left. The harsh reality of the narcotics war does not offer the easy camaraderie of Istanbul or the spiritual rewards of Kathmandu. But Bellevue, as well as hundreds of other psychiatric hospitals, offers a road back to responsibility. But some cannot be reached. At least not with the methods and the answers in current use. Drug takers abound in ever-increasing numbers and not always in the conspicuous hippie community. I know that a lot of people think that uh, junkies, addicts, wander around the world uh, dressed as hippies with beads and flowers and in their hair. But it isn't true of all of them. Peter was very much uh, a boy who liked to wear nice clothes, was always clean. Perhaps the most painful experience for a parent is having a son or daughter who outwardly conforms, but who still conducts the pilgrimage, who still seeks the high, and through his very secrecy, avoids detection, and at the same time, possible help. He's always dependable about being home on time at night, 11, 11.30, which wasn't late. But during all this period, we later found he was on drugs. After the first two years, uh, when he'd been picked up in possession of drugs, uh, it became obvious that his future was very indefinite. We were advised by doctors 
and psychiatrists and probation people that he was heading towards an eventual death. And uh, shortly after his 20th birthday, he died of an overdose of heroin. Man has always searched for instant happiness in a pill. The search is going on as more and more potent psychedelics are developed. The search goes on with many kinds of substances. Our youngsters out here are drinking diluted murine eyewash. They're smoking crushed aspirin. They're drinking banned deodorant. They're injecting accent meat tenderizer. Always in search for the magic high, the magic experience. I think what we as adults have to do is to invite the youngsters to join our adult world and make it a better place. We have to admit we haven't done such a perfect job, but to show them that the answer is not to drop out by dulling their consciousness or changing their awareness, but to help become activists and help us create a better world. Perhaps there is a straight society, a universal establishment that many of our youth reject. But they will not create a better society by freaking out in Kathmandu, or turning on in Los Angeles. They must face up to what they are running away from, work constructively to bring about change if change is needed. And we, as the straight society, must reach out and help with honesty, compassion, and a sincere desire to understand not only them, but ourselves as well. For we represent what they are reacting against.